Okay, here's my slide. Um, for the last 30 years, physicists, material scientists, and chemists, we've become increasingly able to see, manipulate, and create materials at the nanoscale, like that carbon ring you have over there. And more recently, some of us are thinking that precisely these tools we have developed to understand and to fabricate materials at the nanoscales are the tools we need to understand disease, to understand how biology works at the nanometer scale and how biology malfunctions when you have a disease. Uh, so why is that? Just a slide to tell you what is a nanometer that maybe is not very useful. Uh, a nanometer is to a meter what a little ball of rice or a ping pong ball is to the diameter of the earth. That only tells you that it's very small but not much information. Um, the interesting thing about a nanometer, it comes up here apparent when we have a look at biological things. And then we have a look at them and we see that actually the most interesting things in your bodies are happening at that scale. Red blood cells are 5,000 nanometers to be, to be considered nano. Uh, viruses start to be a nano object. They're 100 nanometers, they're ultimate nano machine. They combine to your cells and inject their DNA and completely take over your body. Uh, but more interestingly, when you go to the molecular level, you can see that DNA and proteins have exactly that nanometer range. The, the, the diameter of DNA is two nanometers, and the materials we're talking to, we're talking as nanomaterials are, for example, carbon nanotubes, one to two to five nanometers in diameter, or even buckyballs with are nanometers. So that's why nanotechnology is interested in medicine, is because Biology happens at the nanoscale, and now we have the tools to study it because we've developed for the last 20 years the microscopes, the tweezers, the pulling machines to create these nanomaterials first in organic and study them. And now people like me are using this to study biology at the nanometer scale. So here at the top is a kind of representation of my favorite tool that I've spent all my life working with, which is the scanning probe microscope. It's an atomic force microscope. This microscope is like a nano finger. You have a cantilever and a nano nano tip in the end, a very sharp tip. And you can use this nano finger to tap around this nano world of biology in liquid. You don't need to, to dry things anymore like you used to do with the electron microscopes. Now we can get our nano fingers in the water and feel how DNA works and feel how proteins work. And this is a major improvement because like here on the left you can see for example a molecule of real DNA. It's not a cartoon, it's not pretty, it's very small, complicated, but it's in liquid. And we can see the double helix and it's all very pretty. And to the right we can see, the, we can see with very high detail membrane proteins, but this are not cantus anymore. They move. Our microscopes let us see the dynamics. Because we touch them, we can pull them, we can stretch them. So we can actually do physics. We can move away from the chemistry and the cartoons, and we can start thinking for new ways of understanding and actually targeted and curing disease. Like I said, we're moving from the cartoons we usually see in medical magazines when you have static structures where you can see proteins like these ones over here. This one regulates your need, for example, of having potassium or sodium in your body. And they're dynamic and they're soft and they're flexible. And there we have a picture of DNA, the same picture of DNA I showed you before. And I want to use this picture to tell you something about genetics. In the last two days, We've heard a lot of people talking about the genome and all these genes we know. Well, I don't know if you know that in each of your cells, you have two meters of DNA. And only 2% of this DNA encodes for proteins. So your wonderful genetics is only taking care of 2% of all your DNA. We have almost two meters of DNA left that are doing something, and we don't know what it is. Biologists have called it junk DNA. I'm a physicist, and this is not by chance, and this is not junk DNA. This is the physics of the cell. This is the movement, the mechanics, which is actually getting all the thermal energy from the environment and translating it into a living body. And that's why I think now physicists are moving into biology, because we can finally play with it. We can understand it. We are developing with these nano fingers ways 
of feeling how cells are, not only single molecules. Here are two pictures of cells. We're using pretty much the physics of an acoustic guitar in liquid. So we just bang little, little fingers against our cells very quickly. And pretty much like people that are blind go tapping around their sticks. That's the way we feel the cells. And by the vibrations we produce on our levers, we're able to produce maps of the elasticity of the cells. So we're finding, for example, that cancer cells are softer than non-cancer cells. That when you start a tumor, your cells, of course, have millions of biological markers that biochemists are looking at, but they have simple markers we can see, that we can, the way they communicate with each other changes, and the way the, the mechanics change. So when you get a metastatic cell out of your tumor, it just soft and flows out of the tumor and goes and infects all your body. So some of us are thinking, by looking at all the biochemistry, all the markers, all these lights in the genes that we were showing before, are we looking for the most difficult target? Can we just darkness? Target is stiffness, which is another it's a physical marker of disease. So with all these new ideas, we're using nanotechnology to study and understand single molecules, whole cells, and with unprecedented resolution, we can finally see them working. And we can work together with biologists to solve one of the most complicated problems we have in, mo in modern uh, molecular cell biophysics. But we can also design nanoparticles and nanostructures that together with the no like normal medicines you're having for your disease work better. So I'll show you a few examples. Cancer. So in the labs these days, both in the States, in Europe, in Japan, in China, we are developing drug delivery systems. So right now when you have a cancer in your, whatever in your body, you need a ton of chemotherapy to reach the right dose into the place of the tumor. So that means lots of side effects. You feel very sick and you're living miserable and you prefer to die from the cancer than to go through chemotherapy again. So what nanotech can do right now is to load lots of these drugs in these small shuttles, in small nanoparticles that target exactly the place in the body when you have the tumor. So it can load all the chemo to the right place. So we're not going to cure cancer. We want to make chemo much better. So this is already happening in the labs, and some things are already going into clinical trials. Other area that nanotechnology is helping lots, of course, is in detecting tiny amounts of chemicals in your body, both outside your body and inside your body. Of course, there are, and some people are already developing patches and indeed tattoos that can feel the molecule concentration you have in your body, your hormones, your insulin, and the idea is that it will react on time, at the right time, to your needs. Another interesting thing, yesterday we heard a lot about feedbacks and how our psychology reacts to, to, to our problems. And one could think of patches that you could put in your body that actually are telling you information that is passed into your mobile phones, for example, about your medical conditions. You can do statistics, send it to your doctors, and that's all very practical. But of course, it will put an interesting feedback of our psychological cells with our molecular cells that I find very interesting. Other things we're doing that I'm very excited about recently is to understand tissues. Tissues are macroscopic. They're full of cells, your liver, your lungs, your whatever, your heart, your spinal cord. Um, but they're not just cells like touching each other and making the tissue. To put together this tissue, we have an incredible complicated mesh of filaments. These filaments are nanocomposites, like um, physicists, I like to see it as complicated materials that are like a strings, but they're nano in size. And that means like tissues are macroscopic, but they communicate at the nanoscale. Cells attach to these scaffolds and to each other, and they feel each other not only chemically, like growth factors and all these things you use in modern stem cell technology, but mechanically. These strings pull from the cells, and that makes the cells be what they are. Cells react to stiffness, and there's some great experiments that have shown that if you put a stem cell into a flat surface that is soft like brain, that a stem cell differentiates into brain regardless of the chemical environment. So cells have mechanical sensors, and this uh, strings that we have, these scaffolds, is what the body uses to create your shape.
And we are very interested in understanding these scaffolds and reproducing these scaffolds because when you have trauma or disease, these scaffolds break. We can make them very cheaply. We can make them in all shapes and we can make them from materials like our like crab, the, the crab shells. And they fit very well into your body and we can reproduce very much what happens to the cell inside tissue. Our goal is to create a scaffolds like these ones that we have made in my lab that are able to create the right mechanical environment and chemical environment for cells. That it can not only shape the cells, some, but it can also uh, read from them if they're happy or not. And these scaffolds can be used for fixing a lot of problems, like when they break during disease. For example, spinal cord injury. You know you can fix wounds more or less and you have scars, but if you get broken your spine or you break the contact between your neurons, that's it. You cannot regenerate it. What we are learning in the lab is that you create an environment with this mesh I told you before, I showed you in the previous picture, that is just electrically conductive. That is something that we nanotechnologists can do pretty easily. We can regenerate the contact between neurons. Another thing I just came out in Nature yesterday, I saw it, a group using these ideas have been able to create a conductive patch to when you have a heart attack, your heart cells recover much quickly. And it's just a very simple thing. Create a nanometric structure that also conducts electricity. And that's it, maybe we can regenerate neurons. This is a particularly nice example of a, a group in Harvard that I like very much that I used recently. They made one of these scaffolds and they put signals inside to train the, your immune system. And they put the patch inside and they use, them, they use it to train the immune system to target tumor cells. It's been used in mice and it's been used that they can train the immune system of mice to kill melanoma. So, there's already starting to be the first products using this idea that's in the market. Some products that are very primitive, but they still work on these ideas that are helping people to regenerate bone. Other products that are using liposomes that are going, nanoliposomes that go through your skin that are able to deliver hormones in a very nice way, like creams. As I told you before, one of the problems when you have a big wound is that you lose this nanometric communication in your body. That's why you have scars. And, um, especially nasty for people in wars. So in the soldiers in Iraq are already using some very special nanotech patches that they put in their bodies and help them to heal and prevents them from amputating limbs and in helping all the cells to regenerate there happily without removing, without the need of a scaring. So this is my last slide. I hope I did convince you that uh, whatever you think about your genes, there are other ways of seeing disease. And that because biology happens at the nanometer scale, what the best, one of the best ways we have to both understand it, uh, target it, and diagnose this disease is use nanotechnologies. Nanotechnologies are being used, like I said before, looking at Alzheimer's disease. Some nanoparticles have been already shown that they can break the amyloid plaque in your brain in amyloid patients in neuron, neuron regeneration. Uh, nanoparticles have been used to enhance the, the contrast of MRI and have my better, much better pictures. As I told you before, for regenerating the skin, for regenerating bone, probably neurons, and very soon for heart. And finally, and for me this is the most interesting thing, what nanotechnology will bring is the tools for getting us closer to the reverse engineering of biology. When we can, understand cancer and understand how to shape but cancer cells back into shape. We will have an enormous tool. We will be able to use and manipulate biological matter and that will take us to a completely new game in every possible way. Thank you for your attention.